Welcome back to Chem 230 Introductory Organic Chemistry with Dr. Bob Blake at Glendale Community College in Arizona. And last time we went over some Lewis dot structures for atoms and ions where we can predict from the structure of an atom and how many electrons it has, how many electrons it might lose or gain to form stable ions. And that's one piece of the picture is how ionic bonds form when cations are attracted to anions. So if there's going to be a transfer of electrons, you can get ions, and then when you get ions, they're attracted to each other. So hopefully that makes some sense. The other piece of the picture, one of the other types of bonds, is called a covalent bond. And a covalent bond occurs rather than from the transfer of electrons, from the sharing of electrons. So this is a situation where an atom like fluorine has seven valence electrons. To obey the octet rule, it would want that eighth electron. In an electron configuration sense, a fluorine is 2s2, 2p5 in its valence shell. It's almost got a full p shell. It just needs one more electron to be like the noble gas neon. So it's going to sometimes be able to go grab an electron from something else and take it. And then it would have the extra electron that it, it seems to want. If it runs into something that it can't steal an electron from, though, they might work out a mutually beneficial sharing arrangement. So if you look at a fluorine running into another fluorine, this fluorine isn't any better than the other fluorine at grabbing electrons, so it's unlikely to be able to steal from it. But if you go ahead and share electrons, so each fluorine will retain six electrons all to itself, but now we're going to put a pair of electrons between the two fluorines, where one of these electrons came from each fluorine atom. So this one needed one more in its environment to have a complete shell. This one needed one more in its environment. So they agreed that they would each contribute one electron, you know, pretending they have wills and make agreements and everything. But the, um, in some sense, they agreed to share. One electron each was contributed to a shared pair of electrons and now if you look at the fluorine environment, either one has eight electrons in its environment because it can see the shared pair. Um, in, we, to avoid writing all the dots, we often write a line for the bond or shared pair of electrons. Lewis would have written a pair of dots between the atoms, which serve as the bond. Nowadays we write a line like this as a bond. So now you can see that if uh, nonmetal has room for extra electrons in order to get to the octet rule in the filled shell, it might want to engage in a sharing opportunity with other atoms so that they can form these covalent bonds and see enough electrons in their environment to be stable. So what that means is if we look at a set of nonmetals, we can see from the Lewis structure of the atom and the number of valence electrons how many bonds it might form and then we can write some examples. So for carbon, it has four valence electrons and you can get the number of valence electrons by writing out the electron configuration. So for instance, carbon would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So there's your four valence electrons. And for the Lewis structure, we typically spread the electrons out as much as possible. And some people might say that this way to write the Lewis structure for carbon with the four valence electrons spread out is not consistent with the electron configuration because two of these electrons can be paired. But we don't really need to get picky about that. Um, I just go ahead and put four dots around the carbon and you'll have a good representation of the Lewis structure for the carbon atom. Now, this would mean that it has one, two, three, 
four electrons shy of its octet, so it might want to form four bonds to get to the octet rule. And where Lewis really gained a lot of uh, support for his theory is because not a lot of people knew why carbon might want to form four bonds to hydrogen and make methane, CH4, whereas nitrogen would use bond to a different number of hydrogens. So why does one atom like four hydrogens and the other likes two hydrogens or three hydrogens? And it came down to how many valence electrons an atom had and thus how many it needed to gain or share to achieve the octet rule. So now this carbon and methane has eight electrons in its environment, the four shared pairs. So if we look at nitrogen, nitrogen being group five, S2P3, has five valence electrons. If you draw a dot structure for a nitrogen atom, you get this, and you can see there's three spaces for it to share electrons, so it'll normally form three bonds. And you can do an example where nitrogen finds another nitrogen. Or ammonia, NH3, where the nitrogen finds three hydrogens to share with. So there's different ways we could write out stable molecules that are well known based on a nitrogen forming three bonds. So this is an intuitive way to sort of piece together molecules from atoms and oxygen having six valence electrons would have space for two more electrons and thus would normally form two bonds. And so an example of this, world famous example, water, H2O, two hydrogens would go and share with the oxygen, allowing the oxygen to achieve the two, four, six, eight electrons in its environment that it seems to really want. Again, speaking of atoms like they have wants and needs and all this. And if you go to a halogen like bromine, that group, and this applies to the whole group, so if you look at nitrogen with five valence electrons, phosphorus would also have five valence electrons and would behave similarly to nitrogen. So the group relation, the electron configurations being similar, for things in the same group, you'd accept, expect similar behavior. So bromine, much like the fluorine I used a little earlier in this lecture, um, has seven valence electrons. And if you put seven electrons around a bromine, you can see there's one space, one unpaired electron or radical that would go ahead and form a bond. So you typically get one bond to bromine so if it found a hydrogen or another bromine, it would form a nice single bond where there would be two, four, six, eight total electrons in the environment of this bromine. So now you can see why elements in group seven typically form hydrohalides with one hydrogen and one halogen. Things in the oxygen group, like oxygen or sulfur, will bond to two hydrogens. Things in the nitrogen group, uh, ammonia or phosphine, would form a compound with three hydrogens per element. And if you look at boron though, boron's really interesting because it has three valence electrons. And if you were to go ahead and use all three of boron's electrons to get into sharing arrangements with other atoms, you would end up with three bonds And so people would say borane, BH3, is an example of three bonds in a compound of boron and shows the three bonds. But you may notice that in borane, boron only has six electrons in its environment. So in this case, it's not stable. It's not obeying the octet rule. There's room for two more electrons. So what normally happens with borane is it finds another pair of electrons from somewhere else and goes ahead and forms another bond. So in this one, BH3 is not stable. And if you had a canister of BH3, it would 
change to B2H6 called diborane, as the borane is not stable, it would need to react somehow to achieve the octet. So what normally happens, and I'll give you a, a classic example of borane with its lack of octet rule, an open spot for electrons here, we'll find something with a free pair of electrons like ammonia. Very exciting because now this nitrogen can donate both electrons to form the shared pair, so they call this a dative bond, where one atom is sharing both of its electrons with the other one that is lacking two. So in the other examples, we sort of had each atom donating one of the electrons to form the shared pair. This one's a little more, is a little different with the uh, nitrogen being generous. So the new bond, boron nitrogen bond, is another covalent bond, but the source of the electrons is a little different. But notice now in the stable molecule, boron has one, two, three, four bonds. So what typically happens with boron is you get the three sort of normal covalent bonds, but it forms one more bond, typically a dative bond, to get up to its octet. So in the case where boron is very electron deficient, it will go to great lengths to form extra bonds to remove this electron deficiency. So if you look at any atom in the periodic table, any nonmetal in the periodic table, you should be able to look at the number of valence electrons and its Lewis structure to predict how many bonds it would normally form if it's going to go ahead and form covalent bonds.